Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining our fourth quarter update. I have here with me our CFO Rajiv Disanayaka and Head of Finance Arun Anuradi Dalage. I will briefly take a few minutes to take you through our performance in 2022. Then we will open up for Q&A. So moving on, as you know very well, uh, starting from 2019, we went through really tough three years and 2022 was extremely unprecedented. We saw the country declaring that we will be suspending uh, repayment of external debt. Exchange rate went up significantly. The currency got devalued. Uh, with that, we saw inflation going up and peaking at around 70%. And in order to come back that, uh, the policy rates were increased and the market added a significant premium on the rates. And as you can see in this uh, graph onto your left side, uh, you can see how the PLR has moved uh, since April last year, uh, touching 30% mm -hmm. levels. Uh, towards the end of the year. So uh, the, in a, the interest income increase of over 100% that you see is mainly as a result of this increase in interest in uh, interest rates. With rates going up on one side, the bank adopted a very cautious approach towards lending. Uh, you may see that our loan book has grown by about 14%, but if you take the exchange... If you take the exchange impact out, uh, it's about a 6% growth uh, in our loan book. So similarly, we saw that interest expenses also going up with our bank deposits growing by about 30, 31% in 2022. So here our LKR deposit base itself grew by about 23%. As similar to the uh, trend that we saw right across the industry. We saw movement from CASA into FDs, but with our business model, with our, with our proactive ALM uh, management, we've been able to improve our margins and record one of the highest teams in the industry. And we've seen it increasing by over 300 basis points during the year. Moving on to fee-based income, uh, our net fee income increased by about 54%. This was driven through increased card volumes, uh, trade trade income, uh, partly through digital channels where we saw adoption rates improving with our digital products, with our uh, new digital products. Uh, as you know, with the currency devaluation, uh, with our positions getting revalued, exchanging Come increased from 5.8 billion in 2021 to 19 billion. And also, we've seen a, a strong growth in insurance premium uh, coming from our subsidiary HMB Assurance with a growth of about 20%. And as a result, our total operating income almost doubled, growing by about 90% during the year. So this growth in total income, which came through uh, NII and other income, about 60% of that was taken away by the high impairments. Out of a 91, 92 billion in total impairment, 59 billion was on account of our investments in foreign currency denominated uh, investments in government securities. That's because we increased our uh, impairment on these investments up to 35% for the year. Uh, so with rates going up, uh, taking into account the economic factors, elevated risk, we have increased our impairment on loans and loans and advances as well. So we've seen a in growth increase of about 160% in our impairments on loans as well. Uh, despite that, you will see that our stage three ratio and our provision cover on stage three loans uh, remain at the 
remain as one of the best among our peers. So if you look at our operating expenses, you see that overall operating expenses have increased by about 33, 34%. Uh, but this is with this growth is coming because in 2021, uh, HNB uh, reversed its provisions on uh, pension fund as the uh, retirement age increased from 55 to 60. So if you take this uh, adjustment out, uh, increase in operating expenses was only 22%. And similarly, the increase in operating expenses, you see a 35% increase adjusted for this uh, pension fund uh, reversal, it would be 16%. Uh, so despite uh, operating expenses increasing by about 33% here, as our TOI, as I said earlier, almost doubled, uh, cost to income improved significantly to 22%. If you look at taxation, so there were factors uh, in terms of financial VAT going up from 15 to 18 percent. Corporate tax went up from 24 to 30 uh, percent. Social security contribution levy was introduced. Uh, despite all this, uh, we, we recorded a tax uh, credit for 2022. On one side, um, we reversed. Uh, some of the provisions that we made in the previous years with the settlement of these uh, previous assessments. And on the other side, there were deferred tax assets that were created uh, with the impairments going up. So these resulted in this uh, in uh, tax credit. So in effect, we recorded a PAT of 15.7% for the year and was a drop compared to last year. So if you look at our key indicators, you will see that our uh, capital adequacy, which was at a very comfortable level as at end of 2021, has gradually come down. So one reason for this again is that the high impairments and these high impairments on uh, our investments in uh, foreign currency bonds uh, are not taken as tax uh, deductible expenses. So these are getting taxed and the, a deferred tax asset is created. And this deferred tax asset is actually uh, taken out when we do the capital calculations for the capital adequacy ratio. And on top of that, uh, our risk weighted assets have gone up with the devaluation of the currency. So you will see that our capital adequacy levels are at 11% and 14% respectively for tier one and total capital. Uh, this is against our requirement of a 9.5% and a 13.5%. But as you know, Central Bank has given us leeway to draw down up to another 250 basis points. So in effect, the minimum for us would be a 7% and a 11%. And uh, we have reasonable margin against that at the moment. And uh, looking at liquidity, as you can see, our liquidity levels remain extremely strong against the requirement. Uh, I will go through the group DuPont. So you can see that uh, our income through NII and other income has increased significantly. Uh, by about 4%, but that entire portion has been taken out through or uh, by uh, impairment. So this has resulted in our ROAs and ROEs uh, coming down. So this is basically a snapshot of our overall performance. Uh, and of course, we are proud to say that we were recognized as the best corporate citizen in Sri Lanka last year by the uh, Ceylon Chamber of Commerce. Uh, in recognition of our contribution to sustainable uh, corporate uh, sustainable development. Uh, in addition, we are among the top thousand banks in, in the world. Uh, and of course, we've been recognized by many other uh, rec uh, international bodies. So I will take a pause now and open up for Q&A.
Thanks, Priyanka, for that presentation. Hi, I'm Rajiv here. I think we have got a, a question in terms of uh, the effective tax rate for next year. Well, I think uh, we'll have to go with the current uh, tax rates that are applicable. So you have corporate taxes at 30%. You have financial VAT at 18. You have social contribution levy at two and a half. So taking all into account uh it needs to be somewhere close to 50 percent is what we feel of course there can be various differences in our the way it's accounted and the uh, the and if there are any tax reverses that happen but generally looking at the tax rates you would expect the effective rate to be close to 50 percent So SLDBs, I think most of our SLDBs are paid off. I think we have only a small amount to be paid in uh, March. Uh, so all of our SLDBs, either we have got paid in rupees or by uh, issuance of uh, uh, T-bonds. Uh, and even for the one that is maturing in March, uh we probably will take the option if it is available of taking rupees uh but of course the de final decision will be made only at the time of it being announced so the question there is a question in terms of when and at what levels NPLs would peak? Uh, well, compared to where the country and the economy was last year, I think things have significantly improved and a lot of indicators today shows that things are moving in the right direction, including the IMF package likely to be signed somewhere this month. So all that would be positive compared to what we faced last year. Of course, this quarter will be challenging with the high tax rates, especially on the retail portfolio because the disposable income levels would come down. But I would probably expect if all goes as anticipated, the NPA levels to maybe peak in the first quarter uh, or uh, at least in the second quarter so at the moment net uh, stage three ratio for hmb is at 3.4 it's just a one percent deterioration from what you saw in 2021 so i we, we are quite hopeful that we'll be probably able to keep it uh, maybe might be less than the four percent or maybe somewhere they are about So uh, most of the impairments now we have uh, in terms of our financial assets are for ISBs because as I mentioned earlier, most of our SLDBs have matured apart from a smaller amount. ISBs, uh, we have taken our impairment levels up to 35%. So a question on NIMS, uh, eventually NIMS should come down to levels that we probably have seen uh, in the past, not as low as two to three percent. I don't think we ever had our NIMS as low as two to three because we, uh, I think HNB even in the past has probably had NIMS slightly higher than the industry, but it would uh, come down from the high seven levels that we see today eventually, but may not be in 2023 itself. Of course, it might come down from the seven and a half percent, but still with now uh, monetary authority further increasing or tightening uh, uh, monetary policy with a one percent increase, it'll take time for rates to 
uh, fall and uh, also uh, the uncertainty of a DDR is keeping treasury bill bond rates high so that will to an extent anchor other rates as well and hence uh, I would think most part of 2023 you will see rates on average being higher than even what we have probably uh, seen last year so the NIMS may continue, might fall towards the latter part, uh, but uh, might not be overall as high as seven and a half percent. But it'll take time for it to come down to maybe the four to five percent levels that we have seen uh, uh, before the crisis. on the impairment on uh, financial assets I've already touched. Uh, NPLs have increased. I uh, believe Priyanka in a presentation showed the NPL levels of different sectors, so I guess that was already touched on. Uh, uh, so fixed to floating rate loans. Uh, I would say that most of our loans either will get repriced or will mature. Uh, let's say around 70 to 80 percent of our loans will either reprice or mature within a period of one year. Uh, so, so the uh, so the the fixed to floating would be somewhere in the range of 70 to 80 percent on the floating. So increasing bond investments are almost totally from uh, the maturity of SLDBs. Uh, I doubt that we have had any investments in bonds during the year, so it will be almost totally coming from uh, SLDB payments as well as uh, some other payments. So fees have increased as a, a combination of price as well as volumes. Uh, credit card fees have increased mainly because of volumes have increased substantially compared to 20 and 2021. Uh, uh, trade fees have increased as a result of increase in prices because the volumes came down, but the prices increased in there. Then you'll have other uh, avenues such as digi digital and various other uh, uh, fee lines also contributing mostly because of volume increases. So the NOP uh, NOP is managed quite aggressively. So uh, what happens is most of the export conversions anyway at the moment demand for import or demand for dollars for imports is less. So most of the exports that get converted and remittances that get converted will go into covering the NOP. So uh, we are more or less uh, squared on the NOP position. At the moment, we probably might run a small negative NOP position to benefit from the rupee uh, appreciating, but uh, all the uh, SLDB conversions have already been covered. So HMB Finance post merger, I think the merger itself was very successful and it's been one of the smoothest mergers that probably anybody could uh, witness in the country. Uh, but unfortunately, the events that unfolded post merger has not been very positive for the company. Interest rates going up has a huge impact on them because uh, uh, even on the micro loans, there was a cap at the time. Uh, they have a fairly uh, sizable leasing book, all that were on fixed. And when the de fixed deposits repriced, uh, they had an NII impact. 
uh, collections have also slightly deteriorated, not to the extent that one would expect given the uh, market or the uh, market segment they are in. Uh, I believe they are managing the collections fairly well. The bigger impact came on the NII side with uh, FDs getting repriced. Um, so for a period, they actually went into negative territory, but they have recovered now and making monthly profits. So ISB uh, exposure is in the range of $550 million. I guess that will be there in the annual report. So loan growth expectation. Priyanka, do you want to come in on the loan growth? So in terms of the loan growth, uh, we, as I said earlier, we have adopted a very conscious or a cautious approach and we will be cautious in lending uh, while the rates remain high. So for next year, we will look at uh, a growth of in the region of five to ten percent. So ISB is uh, there is a question whether thirty five percent thirty five percent is from the amount that is booked in the balance sheet. Uh, so we have taken thirty five percent of the balance the amount that is reflected in our balance sheet. So the question on how high it can go will depend on how things will unfold over the next uh, few months, I believe. Hopefully, we are all hopeful that it's going to be a reversal and not an increase from here on. But it depends on the negotiations that happens between private creditors and the uh, governments. Now that the official creditors seems to have concluded their discussions, uh, the private creditors will start negotiating with the government and Lazard uh, in terms of uh, the restructure of ISVs. There's a question on whether there will be raising of tier one, tier two capital. Um, again, I think Priyanka mentioned in her presentation that uh, our capital levels are compared to uh, considering that there is a two and a half percent that we can draw down. Uh, have, we have a fairly uh, decent margin there. <clears throat> of course, uh, if there is and if the if the bank believes and if the shareholders are willing to uh, participate, we could always consider. But at the moment, there are no plans as such. Uh, on the tier two, uh, we believe the rates are too high to immediately go on for a tier two raising. Uh, but if the rates come down adequately, then we would consider uh, a tier two raising, but not immediately. So there is a question on NPL levels of HNB finance. I believe it might have already been probably disclosed in their uh, quarterly submissions. Uh, uh, if they had not disclosed, then I don't think it's right for me to disclose it because it probably is uh, non-public information. Uh, then. Uh, So the moratorium, I, I don't think there is too much of moratorium loans in HMB finance, but I wouldn't have the numbers with me right now in front of me to 
uh, give you that. For the bank, we don't have any moratorium loans at all at the moment at the end of 2022 because I, all the loans would have come out of moratorium. Of course, some would have gone into restructure because there is nothing called moratorium anymore uh, because there is no central bank moratorium. Anyone who is unable to pay, it would have got restructured and, the, and buckets would have shifted accordingly and the impairments would have been made for that. So uh, the word moratorium technically, at least for the bank, does not exist. Anuradhi will take on this question on LGDs and PDs. Anuradhi. LGDs and PDs increasing um, as part of, uh, since there, there was a natural increase in the staging, uh, there are both these numbers have increased during the year compared to 2021. So CASA for 2021 believe would be more positive than what we have seen in uh, 20, uh, sorry, 2023 would be more positive compared to what I've seen in 2022, especially with interest rates falling and FD rates expected to converge with the CASA rates. Um, even in 2022, I think we did fairly well in terms of trying to manage our CASA base compared to our competitors. Uh, but we would probably, ex uh, all the banks saw CASA ratio falling and the, even the CASA base falling in 2022. We would expect the CASA base to grow in 2023 and that's what we are pushing for. Uh, still, the rate differential is fairly high, so it's a challenge. But if the uh, if FD rates fall uh, steeply in the next few months, then you'll see that CASA ratio starting to improve. Uh, so it's 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 an interest rate play. It's difficult to say. I can only say that it'll be more positive than 2022, but whether it'll actually grow. Uh, will depend on how soon the FD rates fall. I think I've already mentioned on ISP impairment being 35%. Uh, and uh, SLDB is, I believe, around $100 million, close to $100 million would have matured during the year. So the trading income is the uh, revaluation of our uh, off balance sheet contracts, the swaps and the forwards based on the exchange rate movement. So that's the 4.9 billion with rupee moving from 200 to 369, all the off balance sheet contracts getting revalued. So that's that's the 4.9 billion uh, trading income that's shown in the PNA. So we have close to about uh, accumulated profits in our FCBU of about close to $100 million. Uh, Are there any further questions? So if there are no other questions, we'll close our, our update call for 2022. Thank you very much for joining with us. We look forward to briefing you all with our first quarter update. Thank you. Have a good evening.